Okay. And we are, come on. Okay, are we live? Technology. Yeah, we're making sure everything runs smoothly here. Just one moment, guys. Just want to make sure that we are going live. And we are live. All right. Good morning, everybody. I am family member Sharon Quirksova, representing North Orange County, which includes the cities of Fullerton, West Anaheim, Buena Park, Stanton, La Palma, and Cypress. Very excited and honored to have, be in this role. I also want to wish all of your families a happy Valentine's week as I have my pink on. I know you and your loved ones uh, will be uh, hopefully uh, engaging this weekend. And we know that uh, it, it certainly has been interesting 2020 and now 2021 with the pandemic. Uh, that being said, we will be spending most of our time here today talking about uh, the pandemic, but I do want to give you a few updates on some other things that I am working on. Uh, some of you already know that I'm the new chair of the Arts and Entertainment Committee for the state of California, and that role is also uh, a role that uh, I take seriously, and it's a serious time as we know that our tourism, our theme parks, our art venues, our entertainment venues have pretty much been put on hold for almost a year. We are uh, hoping uh, to do everything we can to get some of these. Go on in there to see if they're ready. Uh, Joseph, are we muting some people because we hear lots of feedback? Joseph, I can't hear you. Uh, we request that if everyone joining, uh, please mute their microphones as we will be having the participants uh, be live. Okay. All right. So with that, uh, just last week, I introduced a my uh, own bill, my assembly bill 420, a safe reopening for theme parks bill that would essentially move, move small and large uh, theme parks into the same tier. And that would be the orange moderate tier. I myself have been out to uh, not only Knott's Berry Farm, which is part of my district, but also downtown Disney several times. And I can assure you that the protocols that they have in place are far above what I see at the airports as I enter them, what I see uh, in uh, parks, what I see uh, also in uh, other places. So an example being um, as you enter, there's signage, there's staging for people to be six feet apart. But of course, there's also temperature taking. Uh, if one person in the party has a temperature, the entire party would be asked to not enter. Mask enforcement. And the serious that if you are walking um, uh, and eating or drinking, they will ask you to sit down. Uh, so I talked to even families there with their young children or even... Uh, seniors and have said, you know, we feel safer here than we do uh, at some of our big box retail. So with that, that's a big effort, but also us looking at bringing forward investments in uh, not only small businesses with grants that we have seen, there have been PPE loans that are much more extensive, but business grants. I know that the county, the supervisor will be talking about um, some of the work they've done there. Uh, but in addition to that, I'm also on the education committee, so we will be working at uh, bringing forward on how are we getting students back to school as safely and as quickly as possible. And uh, there's never a dull moment, I have to say. Yesterday, we talked about wildfires on one of my phone, phone call. What are we going to do about clearing forests? What are we going to do about making sure that we have infrastructure for uh, the future? Uh, I So this, this job brings many topics. And of course, one of the areas that I will continue to focus on are is housing and homelessness. 
we certainly know that there has been some uh, major efforts in Orange County to do uh, what we can, and there has been some positive steps, but there is much more to do. As we know, there are families on the brink, possibly, um, of losing their homes because many families have been out of work now for close to a year. So we will continue to work on that. But today's topic uh, is related to the pandemic, COVID-19, and we have a special guest with us today. Uh, I will, uh, before we introduce our special guest, which is Dr. Clayton Chow, I am gonna uh, let, uh, not let, ask our um, favorite supervisor, Supervisor Doug Chafee, who represents uh, the fourth district, which are, the covers, uh, I believe all of the cities I represent, but uh, Supervisor, if you'll mention the cities, because there might be a few that are different, uh, and he's going to give some brief comments, and then I will introduce Dr. Clayton Chow and his biography. But uh, Supervisor Doug Chafee, welcome. We need a we need a, a universal mute. Some yes. there we go. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, you thank you, uh, Assembly Person Sharon Quirk Silver. We go back a long ways, where many years ago, uh, not too long ago. You're one of the teachers of my oldest son when he was in the K-3 uh, system in the Fullerton Elementary District. So thank you for that. He's got a great education out of that. And you started him off well. Uh, and thank you too for introducing the theme park bill. There are about 30,000 local jobs at stake that we can help save if that goes through. So I may quickly go through somewhat of uh, my uh, experience here. Uh, the Board of Supervisors was one of the first counties to declare a disaster on account of the pandemic. We recognized the seriousness of it early. And then early on, because we recognized also that testing and contact tracing was very important, we established an ad hoc committee of the board uh, composed of me and uh, Supervisor uh, Andrew Doe. And we've had a lot of frustration along the way, but in result, we've been successful now in establishing enough testing that we have more testing ability and we have those that want the test. You can even get a take home test which we will send to you with a mailer that gets returns it back. I need a dog hug. Hi, Doug. Hi, Doug. And uh, so uh, if I may uh, go on further, the ad hoc testing committee moved, morphed into the vaccination committee about last November when we recognized that vaccine vaccine may soon be available. And as a result of Dr. Chow's efforts and others, we've created what we call super pods. They are consisting of a super pod has what we call clinics. Each one has six clinics and within each clinic, there are six vaccination sites. We are prepared to roll out like at least five of those, including some smaller ones. We also have a vaccine going to other places that we do not control. Uh, such as Walgreens, they're the ones responsible for vaccinating the nursing home people. And we also have vaccine going to CVS and Rite Aid and the hospitals. All in all, about 80% of the vaccine goes there and we only get 20%. So we do the best we can with what we are actually allocated in the county. Now we're going on and began this week with what we call mobile points of dispensing. Uh, and we'll have one of those in Anaheim this weekend. And my entire staff will be there. It's by appointment only. We have Latino Health Access uh, helping with the appointments. So we are trying to reach out to a community of people that has not had much access to the vaccine and improve the numbers for our Latino community. The uh, my staff, uh, we did that one time before already. My entire staff is there. We're checking people in. If people are not there at their appointment time, we call them to confirm it and remind them. If they don't want the appointment, we have a wait list and we move in somebody else into their spot. We do not waste anything. The whole process that we had it organized takes about half an hour. The time you arrived, when you're done, you get your shot and you're back on your way. As important part of this is we will have transportation. We see these mobile pauses like hubs with spokes. In the uh, transportation service, in this case, we try to have Rizar. We go out to reach further out into the community and bring them to the site. And so uh, we are dedicating everything we can to make this, we recognize this, my office particularly does, as the, best, as the most important challenge we have and want to get through this. Um, and I, I think though, even though 
Uh, we are making a lot of progress on that. Uh, still, you must observe the masks and the social distancing, even after you've been vaccinated. We're finding that to be very important. So I know, uh, Dr. Chow, you are the star here, and I don't want to take up too much more time, but I will be available for questions if they particularly concern what the county is doing. So thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, at, at your breakfast club. Thank you, Supervisor. We appreciate those remarks, and I think there will be some similar statements. But Dr. Chow, before we begin, and, and I forget about it, can we as you make your remarks, really focus on some of our underserved communities, as I, I know that that's ur an urgency and that's going to come up um, for many people. Um, but before that, I did have a chance to scroll through our guests, and I don't want to get into uh, uh, naming everybody because I will forget or not recognize, but we do have several uh, uh, school board members and also council members on. We thank them for joining us. I feel like this ages me, but if you remember romper room where you can go through your little wand and look through and say, oh, I see, I see uh, Mayor uh, uh, Pete from the Cypress, I, I believe. I see a uh, uh, new council member, Fra Francis Marquez from Cypress and Superintendent Norma Martinez. So I'm doing what I said I wouldn't do, but there's some many people who are joining us today that I I'm really pleased to see you and thank you so much. I see my friend from Richmond when I taught for so many years, Tracy Romont, who uh, is the teacher right next to me. Okay, I'm gonna stop because I'll get all emotional about some of my friends I haven't seen in a while, but thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Clayton Chow, who is actually, his title is the County Health Officer for Orange County, as we know, and he was named the director uh, last year, May 4th. So he certainly stepped into a very, very uh, high focused job at a time we need somebody like Dr. Ch uh, Chow. Uh, before that, he was the, uh, he worked for HCA, which is the Behavioral Health Services team from 1999 uh, to 2012. And then in addition to that, he was recently the Chief Clinical and Strategy Officer for Mind OC. Now, we don't have time to talk about Mind OC, but I wanna tell you, just so you know what it is, uh, about, and he can correct me, but, but more than a few years ago, many, many people throughout Orange County saw the growing number of homeless people. They also saw that not all, but some of them do suffer from not only mental health issues, but addiction issues. And well over, I think 350 organizations, if you can believe it in Orange County, joined together to form what they called Mind, Mind OC. And Dr. Chow was uh, not only a leader in that group, but really part of spearheading what we call uh, now a place, Be Well OC. So I, Dr. Chow, I hope you'll talk about that but it's, it's very inspiring to see what's happened here in Orange County with Be Well OC. Um, and, he, and what that is, is a coordinated system of public and private partnerships working together to improve Orange County's mental health services. Uh, Dr. Chow has a PhD. Um, has, you know, mostly failed not only um, and when it clinical, comes to people of color, but uh, survivors, right? And, and we talk you know, about you know, ask you women you and girls of color, in particular children. You, um, you know, this isn't always so, the system as much as we, we hope <laughs> for it to be. It's not often the system that is designed or... Anyhow, we are going to, you know, I we want to hear your questions and comments, but if you interrupt, then that means we have to mute everybody, and then we're not going to be able to allow people to go live for, with questions. So it's really, I know some people want to uh, make comments, but we want to hear from Dr. Chell, and I want to introduce him, so please. Um, with that, I'm going to move very quickly over to just letting Dr. Chow take over. And please, if you can refrain from jumping in and making comments as anyone else speaks. Uh, Dr. Clayton Chow, welcome. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Quick uh, Silva, for the invitation 
uh, to your uh, event. Uh, this is fantastic. And thank you, Vice Chair uh, Chefki, for joining us um, this conversation. Um, let me begin by saying that uh, the, um, the COVID-19 uh, has been uh, truly uh, the pandemic of the century, as you know. Uh, this last year, it affects not only the California, but the U.S., the entire world. Um, the, uh, the devastating aspect of it is that we now, uh, close to half a million Americans have lost their life uh, to this pandemic. And clearly, uh, that effect on many, many more individuals who are their families and friends. And so uh, December 16, I will never, ever forget that day. December 16 is when Orange County got our first shipment of the vaccine. And uh, I was at St. Joseph Hospital um, uh, to have a press conference where we vaccinated the very first Orange County resident um, at that hospital, this healthcare provider. And it was very emotional to me because I lost a dear uh, colleague who's a family physician who worked well into his 70s and was uh, contracted uh, COVID-19 from his pa patient and actually uh, passed away in that hospital. So I, I remember still after that first uh, vaccination, I was bawling, crying in the background, um, crying because um, it is the beginning of the end of, of, of COVID-19. And, and, and because uh, even though there's that hope, uh, we still were in the midst of uh, a lockdown uh, because the number of folks who ended up in the hospital was high. The number of people in the ICU uh, was high, uh, which was the number that the state used uh, to uh, uh, issue lockdown for each region. And at that time, I think all of the regions in California was in a lockdown because we were in the middle of a surge. And so um, it, it's, it's significant because it has to do with how we uh, prioritize who should get the vaccine here in Orange County. So let me start by saying that uh, that December 16 was really the beginning uh, for us uh, when the vaccine was coming. And um, if you think about it, it's only a little bit more than, uh, a little bit um, uh, less than two months away that we started this whole process. And I know uh, in Orange County, uh, the, uh, the uh, desire and the demand for vaccine is way more than the vaccines available. And so let me describe on how the different ways that the vaccine get uh, to come to Orange County. Uh, uh, in the beginning, there was three ways that vaccine get allocated to Orange County. The first way is through the federal government directly to the long-term care facility staff and residents uh, via a CVS and Walgreens. And that process started on December 28th in Orange County. So that's one way the vaccine come to Orange County. The second way is directly from the state to what we call uh, multi-county entity, MCE. These are entities that have footprints uh, in more than three counties in California. And the MCE entities in Orange County are UCI, uh, the Provident Health System, which include St. Jude, St. Joseph, and the two mission hospitals, and then uh, Kaiser. So they had their, um, um, allocation directly from the state. Then the state allocate a different way to the healthcare agency and the healthcare agency um, uh, under the uh, support of the uh, state um, try to encourage the individual provider to sign up and be certified as the COVID-19 vaccine uh, uh, providers. And currently in Orange County, there are um, uh, Oh, a little bit over 300 providers um, uh, who uh, have been certified by the state and they have to go through a process. Now, um, before the vaccine time, uh, we, 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 we predicted that this vaccine is gonna be complicated because at least the first two 
vaccine that has been authorized by the federal, uh, um, the FDA, uh, are quite uh, difficult to administer. Difficult in that it requires uh, ultra low uh, temperature freezer in terms of storage, uh, require uh, careful transportation. And then in the thawing process, uh, you need to make sure that uh, you do it right and so that uh, you don't waste any dose because if you have it out and thaw in room temperature, there's a certain amount of uh, hour that you have to use uh, before uh, it's no longer uh, um, uh, active and you have to get rid of it. Uh, you probably heard the news yesterday that we had uh, a refrigeration uh, issue uh, down at Soka University, one of our super pods. Uh, my team has been working closely with the manufacturer of Pfizer, and uh, at the end of the day, we received a letter from uh, Pfizer that uh, those vaccines uh, that was affected by the uh, refrigeration uh, issue uh, were good to go, good to use. So that was good news, uh, very, very good news that we didn't waste any vaccine. Uh, so, uh, so just to tell you that it's much more complicated than the seasonal flu vaccine. The seasonal flu vaccine, all you have to do is line people up, and I used to do that, go into the neighborhood uh, with a van and getting people in the neighborhood to come out to get the flu vaccine. All I have to do is to have them roll up their sleeve, give them the vaccine, and off they go. Then I just report up to the state. Today, I've done, you know, how many hundreds of people, and that was it. Well, this vaccine is complicated because we have to, uh, ask for uh, uh, pre-vaccination health questionnaire. We have to submit it to the state. We have to submit individual information. And then we have to make sure that we bring people back with the second dose. And with the two vaccine, one, the second dose must be three weeks away and the other one must be four weeks away. And then keeping tap of uh, who got what is really, really important then you also need to make sure that people who have side effects can report into the system. So it's, Dr. it's much Chow, can more you, complicated. Could yes, you talk, talk about, and again, you clearly mentioned the refrigeration and the temperatures. And so that of course makes it much more complicated as a mobile unit would have to have that. But can you talk about the mobile units and uh, how those are operating as far as what type right. of refrigeration you have on and, um, as those start to move through, because I know that the neighborhoods that we're seeing that are very, very impacted, uh, those again are the same neighborhoods that have some of the lowest vaccine rates. Right, I will address that. So, so you understand that's the way that the, the vaccine come to the county. Just recently as this week, the federal government uh, has also uh, announced uh, three more ways that vaccine can come to the county. So the first wave is the federal government work with the state uh, to stand up two uh, super sites. And in California, the two sites are Cal State uh, LA and then the Oakland Alameda uh, uh, Stadium. Uh, what we was informed by, by the state as of yesterday is that those two sites will be open to anyone, regardless of what county you live in. And they are rolling it out sometime next week. So that's another way that people in each county could get the vaccine. Uh, one extra way is that the, the federal government have contracted with pharmacy directly to provide limited number of vaccine to each county. And in California, the two uh, pharmacy chains that have signed up to that contract are Rite Aid and CVS. And I was informed that in the county, all county, there will be 10 CVS sites that will be stood up uh, by tomorrow and, and 30 uh, Rite Aid sites in Orange County by tomorrow. And if you wanna know where those sites are, uh, go on to the CVS website as well, Rite Aid's website uh, to find out. And they are only open for the individual who live in this county, and but they have very limited uh, 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 capability. Um, Are they still uh, in the one A group as far as yeah. who can? Well, they will have to follow the eligibility list of the county. 
So I'm gonna explain the eligibility list for Orange County in a minute, okay? So, uh, so those are the two, uh, the second way that the federal government just announced. And then the third way is that the federal government will also allocate certain number of vaccine, we don't know how much yet, to our county uh, federally qualified community clinic, uh, FQHC. And so in Orange County, we have about 20 uh, FQHC or so. And you, you, know, you will be able to find out who they are by going into the Orange County Community Clinic Association website, okay? So that's, a, that's really good news. So more option and more availability of the vaccine. Um, uh, can I get my team, Joseph, can you put it in the chat, the two um, websites he basically talked about? Uh, to yes. Make sure people can find that in the chat. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Don't mind me jumping in here and there. No, don't worry, ma'am. Yes. So let me talk about the eligibility. As of late last Thursday, uh, the state issued a new eligibility list. And the list goes like this. Uh, it is age-based framework. Um, but I have to warn you that there's some confusions on that eligibility, right? So it started out saying that it's the age-based framework and the people who qualify in the order of, number one, critical and healthcare provider, for sure. That is the first way uh, yes. since December 16 that we are trying to do that. And in Orange County, we have a little bit over 200,000 healthcare providers. Uh, then the state go to uh, 65 and older, okay? Now I wanna let you know that I'm proud to say that Orange County is actually the first county even before the state announced that uh, we made individual over the age of 65 eligible here a little bit over three weeks ago. And the reason being, we looked at our data and we, we asked the question, who were dying in Orange County? Who were the people who were occupying the hospital bed? And who were the people who were occupying the ICU bed, the intensive care unit bed in Orange County? And remember earlier I said that the reason the state put each county into the lockdown was based on the availability of the ICU bed. So if, 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 if the county ICU bed was below 15%, then the county or the region would go into the lockdown, which prompted the entire state of California went onto the lockdown before Christmas. Remember that? And so we were looking at, well, who are occupying the bed? And we found out that in Orange County, when we look at the ICU bed, over 72% of the individuals who were in the ICU bed were senior, right? Then we look at, well, who were dying in Orange County? And consistently since the beginning, 75% of individuals who die in Orange County are senior over the age of 65. And we thought, we got to go at the most vulnerable population and get them vaccinated. You got to turn off the spigot of people who ended up in the ICU. Otherwise, we're going to be in the lockdown forever because people we're in we're in the surge and people ended up in the hospital. I mean, to the point where we have to set up few hospital in several hospitals in Orange County just because we ran out of hospital bed, we ran out of ICU bed, just because. With the, most of our hospital had to convert other bed, other uh, section of the hospital to create hospital bed for people with, with COVID-19. And so we quickly realized that we got to vaccinate our senior to stop that, right? And so I, I believe it was um, uh, the, the vaccine task force approved it on Sunday, uh, January the 10th. We went to the board supervisor on uh, Tuesday, uh, January the 12th, and we got the approval. And then that night, uh, Secretary Mark Daly uh, contacted me and said, hey, what are you doing? And I explained to him what we were doing. Then the state looked at the data. And the next day, the state announced 65 and older as the eligible list, okay? But- Doc, just can I jump in and ask, on yes. the 65% uh, that are not only dying, but the 72% that are hospitalized. Of that, I know there's been a pretty dramatic story about, um, to be honest, race, as far as 
uh, what percentage, I mean, I, I know generally I've heard it's been three to one with our Latino Latinx families. Um, is that pretty much what you're seeing? So for the hospitalization um, uh, data, um, actually uh, it's uh, uh, equally um, uh, spread out among Asian, uh, white, and uh, uh, Latino. So it's almost a third, a third, a third in people in the ICU. Uh, when you look at death, uh, pretty much the same way uh, for the age of uh, 65 and older, but for 65 and younger, uh, the majority of people who die from the ethnic perspective uh, overwhelmingly are Latino. Okay, although it's 25% so of total of those who die, but that 25% bucket are Latino, right? And then we and also, so when we look at the senior who pass away, we do know that senior over the age of 65 who live in the lowest uh, SES quartile in the county have a higher risk of dying than their peer outside of that area. And so the lowest SES quartile in Orange County are zip code and neighborhood within the city of Santana, Anaheim, and part of Garden Grove. And a few slivers so, of the stop, area. Stop, just, just for a second there, because um, it, it's, it's the, the data is devastating. And, um, and this isn't for a lack of Orange County officials or the state working, but what we clearly see is folks that are working in the front lines younger, whether they're delivery, whether they're restaurant workers, whether they're hospitality, whatever is still open, whether they're retail clerks, uh, three to one, the Latino community is dying. But we also know that they live in, in much more dense housing. Yep. Yep. And we know that uh, these impacts are spreading from family member to family member. And so in many ways, I'm not looking to, to, to cast blame or anything like that, but I, I do, do want our listeners to know these impacts because we have kids who are doing online learning and it isn't now far-fetched to think that they could have lost a grandparent, a parent. Uh, uh, we also know that in the Latino community, uh, some of the chronic conditions like diab being diabetic or even obesity play into this. So I'm just underscoring this because tomorrow we are doing a press conference and it's just to, to, for the urgency to, for neighbors and community members and churches and uh, like you say, healthcare to urge the community to when they can get vaccinated because there's so much, um, I think hesitancy in some ways because they don't know enough people who have been vaccinated in their community to say it's safe. Look, this is, uh, so I just underscore that because it's really, devastating. I myself personally, uh, you know, lost a brother right before the new year. Uh, th there, there are too many people that we know now. Almost every day I look at my Facebook feed and somebody else I know. So I'm sorry, Dr. Chow, just go ahead and continue, but I just wanted to underscore that. No, Assembly Moon, that is a very important point. I've always said, and you heard me talk about this from day one, this pandemic, what it does, it really pushes the, um, the issue of uh, equity around social and health uh, to the forefront, right? Uh, we know that people who have chronic health conditions like diabetes, obesity, uh, are at higher risk of dying or have higher risk of uh, worse conditioning when they get COVID, right? But all of this condition, all of this issue around uncontrollable diabetes, hypertension, and obesity existed way before COVID, right? But we never had a concerted effort countywide to address that, and especially address it in an area of vulnerable, right? The lowest SAS uh, community, certain 
ethnic group that have a higher propensity of developing this chronic health condition and not have the issue taken care of because of the barrier around the health system. We know that, right? And so I think that the only good thing come out of this pandemic truly is that it really caught our attention, the public health people attention that, wait a minute, these chronic health condition, these inequity around social issue, around a health issue, we must address. Because I, I guarantee, and there's more other stuff that we need to address, such as you know, environmental pollutions and all of that, because it's play into the infectious disease. There have been a lot of research now looking at COVID-19 and why it happened. It truly has to do with the imbalance in our environmental pollution, environmental health, that I guarantee you from a public health perspective, if we don't address it, within a decade, we will have another pandemic. Within a decade, we will have another pandemic. We don't address all of this together. We don't address the issue of social and health inequity. We will be in the same, we will be in trouble again within the next decade. Remember, it's only a, this decade that we have multiple infectious disease, right? H1N1, uh, Zika, Ebola, all of that, and, and, and now COVID within this last decade. And so it, 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 it very well, another pandemic will come within, within this de next decade if we don't address all of this issue, okay? So some oh. of the top lines I'm hearing, first of all, um, and thank you for, I mean, we, we could spend a lot of time is there has been inequities as far as not only who, um, who are being hospitalized, but who are of course dying. We also know there's health care issues just at the bottom line of who has health care, who doesn't have health care. Um, but one of the things, again, I continue to hear is um, that even when available, which we know we're not, you know, we're still at 65 and older, uh, about uh, individuals who either say they're not going to get vaccinated, we know that they cannot be forced to be vaccinated, um, but also the concern about uh, ramifications from taking the virus. Can you talk about that and what you're seeing out there as individuals who already have, have the virus? I mean, taking the vaccination, sorry. Yes, so most recently you saw on the news earlier this week that there's a gentleman in Orange County uh, who uh, got the COVID vaccine uh, after his second dose uh, of the vaccine. And the media was up in arm. Look, 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 this guy have finished his cycle, as you will, two thought, and he still got the vaccine, he still get infected. Well, remember, the vaccine is 95% effective, which means that there are 5% of the population who might not be protected by the vaccine, okay? Some of you might say, wow, 5% not, not protected by the vaccine. Folks, the seasonal flu vaccine at best is 60 to 70% effective. We have to put that in perspective, okay? The two vaccines we have authorized now are 95% effective. The seasonal flu vaccine at best 60 to 75 percent effective. You, you, you see the you, you see the difference, and so of course we're going to have people who are not protected by the vaccine. That is not something strange. I'm not understanding why the media play it out as oh my god, it's a big deal, right? So when available, we need to urge friends, coworkers, neighbors. Uh, as best we can to get the virus. In the meantime, um, in the meantime, the alternative, the alternative is no vaccine and the devastation that we see. Right, lots of people get infected. The most vulnerable are dying. I, I, I want people to realize that, and these are not fake numbers. Sorry, no pun intended. These are not fake numbers. 
And for a country like ours, yes, we have inequity in health. Yes, we have inequity in social uh, 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 services and what have you. But in a country like ours, we have that level of people who are infected and we have that number of people who are dying. That is unconceivable. H how did that happen? These are not fake number of folks. These are hundreds of thousands of people who have died from COVID. Okay, so, so I want to stre uh, stress that. So let's come back and talk about mm -hmm. our uh, equity issue. As you all know, since the beginning of the pandemic, people who live in the lowest uh, SES, the social economic area in Orange County, and we already identify where those uh, zip codes and neighborhood are, have had a higher infection rate than folks outside of those uh, zip codes or neighborhoods. And that's why last June, we worked with a coalition uh, of uh, Latin, uh, 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 Latinx uh, community-based organization, school, community clinic, led by uh, Latino Health Access to really go into these neighborhoods and test people. Because we need to test people to detect early so we can provide the support that they need and also contact trace and stop the spread. And we were very successful. I mean, within a matter of a month, a little bit over a month, we brought down the positivity rate at one, at one point at certain neighborhood from high to 20% down to single digit percentage. So that's very successful. And that's why we are how taking they, that phase. Can you tell us how they, um what are the ways they're communicating with neighborhoods that we know so are very we, active? Yeah, they yeah. Doing? yeah. So we we uh, we utilize Promotora community health workers to go into the community community, educate the community, uh, invite them out for testing, and when they test it positive, uh, support them in what to do. Uh, we even put them up in hotel motel. Uh, to separate them from their family. As you pointed out, Assembly Woman, that we are impacted with uh, the, uh, the number of families live in the same roof uh, just because of poverty, just because of uh, other barriers, right? We know that. And so we're able to demonstrate that when you approach that, and we educate people about wearing masks, being physically distancing, and wash their hands, which we still have to do now. We have to continue to do now. The okay. ongoing effort. Yes. Um, yes. Dr. Choi, we're going to move towards um, some of the questions you've answered a lot. I know uh, for me, uh, one of, of course, in my district, West Anaheim, Buena Park, Fullerton, West Fullerton, we've had some very high numbers. And uh, we know that they're uh, as you say, it's going to take trusted partners, whether it's the promotoras, whether when schools can get access. Uh, it's also going to take the clinics and the community centers where people can walk to because we, under, we know that not everybody can drive and be at a super site um, or super pod site, um, whether it's because of transportation. Um, but... <laughs> If, if, I ex if I explain the way we approach it, it might answer all your questions, I'm hoping. Okay. <laughs> so, so there are several ways we are um, uh, administering the vaccine currently. Of course, the county is not the only one. We have partners of the health system uh, that started to vaccinate individuals who are <laughs> 65 and older uh, um, help us do that, right? Remember, I described the way that different vaccine get different way vaccine get allocated to Orange County. Uh, we we have several approaches, and remember, 65 and older have only been added to the eligibility list a little bit over three weeks ago, right? I mean, it seemed like a long time ago, but this is recent. And so, what we've done early on is there are healthcare providers who are not part of a health system, who are like your single solo practitioner therapists who have their own private practice. So they were not connected to any health system to get their vaccine, even though they were eligible. That's why we stood up the super part in Anaheim and Sofra University, mainly is to catch all the healthcare providers who were not attached to any health system and therefore had no access to vaccine to come to those sites for the vaccine. 
the sooner we stood up, then the 65 get added to the system, right? Right now, even though the state have added eligibility list uh, to the eligibility list, educators, um, food and agriculture worker and, and first responder. Um, by the way, in Orange County early on, we added first responder, those who are in a high risk area, the lowest SES area to the eligibility list because we know they were exposed and they had a higher risk of getting infected, okay? But we're only allocated, we're only allocated the vaccine to use for the healthcare provider and the 65 and older. We are not allocated vaccine to, to use for the other group that the state added to the list. I wanna make that important point, right? And the healthcare workers and the senior in Orange County combined, there are over 700,000 individuals who are eligible in Orange County. But the allocation to the county at best somewhere between 32 to, to 35,000 doses a week. So you do the math. It's not enough. Right? It's not enough. It's not enough even for the eligible list right now, right? When we look at who, uh, uh, who are all the senior living in California, LA County has the largest 65 and older, uh, older residents. The second county that have the next largest group is Orange County. There are over 500,000 senior over the age of 65 in Orange County, even larger than San Diego. Now San Diego has more healthcare providers than, than Orange County and LA is of course the top, right? But I want people to understand this because I kept getting questions an email, some of the email was actually pretty rude, telling me, why are you holding back vaccine and not vaccinate teacher and what have you? The answer is because we're not allocated vaccine for those groups yet. We're only allocated vaccine for healthcare provider and senior. And at best in the senior, we've only this last three weeks since the beginning of adding 65 year old to the eligibility list, we've only been, uh, been able to vaccinate a quarter of the senior in Orange County, one quarter. And they continue to be in the ICU and the death that we have continue to be senior, senior who living in the community, not senior in long-term care. The data is there on our website. You can all visit our website. By the way, Joseph, if you don't mind, put it in ochealthinfo.com slash forward. Uh, COVID-19, yes. okay? Yes. Okay. So, so uh, we, we, have, we, and we, and the state is just grappling with this as well, which yeah. is the same across the state, which is there's a supply issue and bringing it down from whether it's the federal government, whether it's weather issues. I know there's a huge um, uh, freezing storm that's looking towards the coming down through the South um, states. But again, all of that's a transportation issue. Uh, so there's multiple, issues here. Right. We're making a dent in the 65 and over uh, and also a dent in the health care providers. Yeah. Uh, if so, the supply continues to move in the way you're expected, when do you think the next tier or do you even have any estimates? So, so what, we, what we did was when the state issued this new added list to the, the eligibility list last Thursday night, uh, I called the community um, COVID-19 vaccine task force. By the way, if you don't know, we have a task force since September. <laughs> well represented. And so we had a conversation about what to do. The allocation is this much for this group, but yet the state adds more group to it. What do we do? So the vaccine task force decided that we will charge on with continuing to push all of our effort in vaccinating the healthcare provider as well as the senior 65 and older for the next two weeks. Then we'll come back and reevaluate and see where, we, uh, where, where will we uh, progress by then. And the board approved it on, on Tuesday. And the most important piece too is that we will focus on the inequity as it relates to ethnic. Because in Orange County, when you look at the 500,000 senior 65 and older in Orange County, the ethnic breakdown 
and, and who have gotten vaccinated, and this is what we observe, 60% uh, of the uh, senior in Orange County are white. And we look at those senior who have finished the vaccine, 60% uh, of them are white. 21% um, are Asians. Uh, and then we look at the uh, Asian senior who get vaccinated, we achieve 25%. Um, black is 1.5% of the senior, and we achieve 0.5% only, okay? Uh, senior 65 and older, uh, uh, Hispanic is 15%, uh, Latino, Hispanic 15%, and we achieve 10%. So we do know that Black and, uh, and Latinx senior uh, lag behind. And so we need to concentrate on how to get those seniors to come out and make access available for them so they can get the vaccine. So that's our chart for the next two weeks to do so. So let me talk about how we're gonna go about doing that, okay? So uh, Advanced OC, and please Joseph added, Advanced mm -hmm. OC is the platform we brought into Orange County last September to help you us say advance OC. Advanced. Advanced OC. Yes, so it is a platform called Social, uh, uh, social Progress Imperative, where we look at 52 uh, social and health index by census tract. And it will be able to tell us um, how well each census tract is doing. And clearly, it's matched up with our lowest SES quartile in Orange County. Okay. And so we use that data, we overlay the uh, positivity rate of COVID 19 on top of it, and it light up on which are the community neighborhood that we need to concentrate on in bringing people out for vaccination. Right. And remember, when we do this, we are still concentrating on seniors 65 and older because that's the eligible group, right? So what we're gonna be creating is what we call medium pots. So these, oh, so the super pot set a center at, at Anaheim and Soka University have the capacity of uh, vaccinating upward of 8,000 people a day, okay? But we're not at maximum yet because there's vaccine limitation, the number, okay? Uh, then we're going to create what we call a medium pod in Santa Ana College because that's right at the heart of all these lowest SES quartile. Okay, and that medium pod would be able to vaccinate up to a thousand people a day. And what we're going to do is we're, we're going to work with community clinic, community-based organization, and as well as OCPA and Abraza. OCPA and Abraza would provide the transportation door-to-door -door transportation to go into the neighborhood in Santana and Anaheim where those senior, particularly the Latinx senior, to bring them and transport them to uh, uh, Santa Ana College for vaccination. The third way we're doing it is we're working with the community clinics uh, and the Latinx uh, collaborative to go into neighborhood and define where are people who have trouble even going to the medium pod that we bring the vaccine to them. So two pods, point of dispensing, two pods in Santana and one in Anaheim, okay? And then we are also similar pattern working with the community clinic for two extra pods throughout the entire lowest SES area in Owens County to bring in the folks for vaccination, okay? And then uh, we understand that certain religious belief would prevent people from getting the vaccine um, because of per perception. And uh, even though we got the blessing and you know, Bishop Van in his office has spoken out uh, encouraging folks that for the Catholic faith, the vaccine is okay and encourage people to consider the vaccine. Uh, we're gonna put a couple events, special event for vaccination uh, on on uh, Crystal Cathedral campus. So contracts is, is we're working out the contract right now, mm -hmm. and so that will come up soon. So those are the special ways, uh, Assemblywoman, that we're going to be approaching how to address the equity issue, how to bring out the uh, um, a black community and Latino community. I know staff is working with a black church. 
here in downtown Santa Ana to outreach into our black senior to bring them out for vaccination. Well, I hope those of you with us have kind of, um, from the very beginning, the data is stark and it's devastating, but I, I personally myself feel uh, much better to hear the rollout of what's coming firsthand to understand that there's notice being, uh, there's uh, uh, those who are working in coalitions and in, in task force are understanding the impact on certain communities. I really appreciate that. We invite you to our press conference tomorrow, uh, Dr. Chow. Uh, we are uh, definitely have questions. I think many, many of them were answered, but if there are lingering questions or comments, you can put them in the chat and we'll make sure, but leave your email so we can get back to you. Uh, I would, uh, one suggestion just from your here, here, what you were saying, Dr. Chow, is there are trusted news uh, sources within the API and Vietnamese community, even in the Latino community, uh, getting uh, some type of press or how this can be administered, because I know that in, in, uh, many of the, the community members do read those newspapers or hear the radio, or uh, even uh, broadcasts, that, that's another way, but we will do our part in North Orange County. If you live in North Orange County and you are seeing or noticing that somebody that you know is having a hard time, whether it's with the technology part of it, whether it's with uh, calling, please call our office. We can help navigate. Uh, we certainly cannot move people ahead of anybody else. But if they qualify and it's because of a technology issue that they can't get on, if it's because of a transportation issue, any of those, that's what our office is here for. We want to help. Joseph, please put our contact in. in. Uh, but again, to all the, uh, I see several elected officials, school board, this is a, a job for all of us to do because it literally means life and death for some of our members. Uh, Dr. Chow, any closing comments? Yes, ma'am. I, I, I want to I wanna thank uh, your office for your advocacy at the state level. I want to thank all the mayors and city manager who've been participating and, and supporting the, the work. And I want to thank uh, Vice Chair Doug Chafee. And really, he was the one and Supervisor Doe grilled me on what are you doing for the most affected uh, community in Orange County? which happened to be district one and four, right? And so I, I, he, he was the one who pushed me to have that pod in Magnolia High School uh, a few weeks ago to respond to our senior. Um, and, and, and I know um, um, I, I, I know people say, oh, you, you do this, me, do this and do that. I want to let people know that this is a community effort. This is a multi-agency effort from county government to city government uh, to uh, sheriff department, all the different uh, uh, police departments, all the different uh, fire departments. I mean, New Year's Eve, we stood up an incident management team uh, concept uh, to put up the, uh, the super park. I'm proud to say that Orange County is the first entity in, this, in the country that put up super park because we first realized that when we get enough vaccine that are more than the demand, we need to push this vaccine out into arm um, as fast as we can because we initiated and we activated Operation Independence because we want to make sure that enough people who want the vaccine have the vaccine so we achieve herd immunity. And you probably heard the term herd immunity thrown around and that is enough people who get the vaccine, at least 70% of our community get the vaccine so we can reopen our our economy, right? And our goal is to be open on July 4th. Get it, Operation Independent. We want to celebrate July 4th, 2021 in a big way. And that's why we know we have to have capacity that are so efficient that you go in and out with the uh, vaccine. Right now at Soka and Anaheim, by the time you get up to, if everybody show up on time, by the time you get up to the, uh, um, the um, not the registration, but the uh, screening uh, uh, table to the time that you get a vaccine in your arm, less than three minutes, that is efficiency, 
right? Unless we have that kind of efficiency, we're not going to be able to vaccinate millions of people on time, right? And that's why we need to have that model going. And now I, I can say the federal government is using that concept to build up superpot as well. Okay. I, I know so there's that, a, a we're gonna, problem. Yeah. We're uh, gonna there's, there's wrap issue, it up. You, but we're trying to do it well. Dr. Chow is, and I'm sure he's had many, many uh, tireless evenings and fielding calls and being on Zooms. Uh, but I do want to just wrap up and say thank you so much. Thank you to those that are leading their communities out there. And again, it, you don't have to be an elected official. You could be a neighbor who checks on a neighbor. You can uh, get these websites to people if they're not sure, if they're having a hard time navigating. You have uh, Supervisor Doug Chafee's office you can call. You have our office in North Orange County. Several of your local electeds are here, school board members, they have information. But we'll just wrap up the call by saying the vaccine is started, it's coming, yet we still have uh, for some several weeks, depending on your age, maybe even going into the summer. So to prevent spread, wear a mask, Yes. Wear a mask. Wear get a mask. tested. My get tested. My sister's a frontline worker in Kaiser, and she's had her double mask and has not had any infection. She does have the vaccine, but wear a mask and wear two to even be safer. One is good. Two is better. One is good. Two is better. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Be safe, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye, yes. everybody.